Welcome to Naturistic, a biology podcast focused on ecology, evolution, plants, and animals. I'm Nash Turley, a biologist, and each episode I research a specific subject and present what I've learned to my co-host, Hamilton Boyce. This time around is part one of our discussion on genetically modified BT crops. Hello, Hamilton Boyce. Hello, Nash Turley. Uh, what's new with you? Oh, man, I've got a, a fresh, uh, sparkling, pure LaCroix here in front of me, ready to keep me <laughs> hydrated through this episode. A, a little bit of bubblies on the mic, perhaps? Yeah, a little, uh, you know, the, the sparkling mouth, as, <laughs> as I like to call it. <laughs> it's industry secret, from what I hear. <laughs> right. Get that crisp brightness, you know, on the on the mic. <laughs> not, not actually the first podcast podcast where i've heard people say they're drinking Lacroix <laughs> while doing it so <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know it's kind of self-explanatory like why would you not drink Lacroix while making a podcast yeah. and that other one was also recorded in la so maybe it's an la thing hmm. it's like oh do you have a podcast in la and while drinking Lacroix? oh yeah i do oh you do too oh all right. oh you do oh, all right we all do that's great <laughs> yeah that's how we that's how we roll down here <laughs> I have no transition to go from LaCroix to our okay. uh, well, pretty complicated topic what, today. <laughs> what's, what's been up with you, though? Because this might be a better transition. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I've been researching this thing like crazy is really one of the main things I've been doing. Yeah. Th- this, uh, I, I learned halfway through that this was a topic that was kind of a perfect storm of having to read a ton of papers in that it's somewhat controversial. So even within the science papers, there's like lots of different opinions. Right. I felt it needed a big background to kind of understand the context of it. So there's like a wide diversity of topics to cover. Right. And then lastly, it's got some like really complicated microbiology and stuff, which is definitely not my area of expertise as an ecologist. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. All of, all of those things together was like, I think it was like 25 papers or something. Oh I man. Mostly read. Yeah. You had to go back to, to undergrad for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, take that microbiology course that I, I never took. <laughs> um, but the, all that topic is, is BT crops. And I imagine that is not a phrase that most people know what that is, but it's a, it's a type of genetically modified plant that's used pretty commonly now in agriculture. Okay. So I, I had you heard of BT before? I had not heard of BT. If anyone knows about GMO plants, genetically modified plants, normally it's Roundup Ready plants, which is the most common type, but that's actually, those are ones that are resistant to herbicides. We're not even going to touch those. This is a different type of genetically modified plant. So this is a less common type uh, slightly less, yeah. although now most GMO crops in the U S at least are both of them. Oh, okay. They use both. So they're sort of becoming equally as common in a way. Yeah. Yeah. My extent of knowledge is basically GMO. Right. Like it yet, yeah, like, like binary, like it is or it isn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So we'll, we'll expand on that for sure. Nice. And, uh, hopefully, cause I feel like obviously the, the topic of GMOs can be very divisive especially there's kind of this liberal crowd that really hates them and i feel like normally they don't know anything about them they just sort of feel it's icky and unnatural or something yeah totally so i'm not you know i'm not like the goal isn't to make people love them but i think when people know more about them it at least is a more informed opinion (laughs) yeah totally when it comes to setting up the topic eventually of getting to gmos we, we sort of have like four acts to this First is talking about crop domestication, because that's really the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then about the things that eat crops, because GMO or these types of GMO plants are to prevent insects from eating them. Mm -hmm. And then what BT is and how it works. And then finally, to some new developments of how insects are interacting with them. So those are sort of the four acts we got to get through. (laughs) Cool. And this might end up being way too long, but, you know... It is what it is. We'll go with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Shakespeare didn't have to edit his down when he had... Anyway. 
<laughs> we have full documentation of that he did not hit him. <laughs> yeah. all, all the all the drafts were burned. <laughs> so so starting with what is domestication, and so it's basically when humans, well, when one species creates a new variety of another species that are controlled in some way to benefit them. And I say not just humans, because there are some examples of domestication in nature where leafcutter ants, for example, there's one, they go and harvest leaves and they bring them back and then they grow fungi on them. And the fungi that grow on the leaves that they eat are really basically domesticated. They've evolved to only live in these gardens that the leafcutter ants create. So yeah, it's wow. basically like domestication. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And there are some uh, beetles that have done a similar thing with fungi as well. They, they bring the fungi to a tree that they infect the tree with the fungi, and then that allows them to eat the tree. Huh, crazy. And these are, these are basically fungi and insects that are living side by side mutualistically in something that's very analogous or fully fitting the definition of being the fungi being domesticated. Right. But humans do the most domesticating. So the most uh, dramatic form of domestication is when um, a species is then unable to live in the wild on its own, like without its domesticated master. So like, you know, if a cow that we domesticate, we let it go and it just dies because we're not feeding it or whatever. That's the most dramatic form of domestication. Right. Plants are actually the thing we've domesticated the most. Probably the first domestication we ever did was plants about... 12,000 years ago in the Middle East was the first documented case of humans domesticating something. Go Middle East. Represent. I think I heard some evidence that the early stages of dog domestication may have been before that, but definitely the first plants domesticating was in the Fertile Crescent, uh, mostly like grain, wheat, things like that, uh, 12,000 years ago. Nice. The Middle East was a big hot spot, but there was a bunch of others that happened somewhere you know, around a similar time somewhere in the 10,000 years ago range, Mesoamerica, the Andes, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Eastern North America, and throughout a bunch of islands as well. So humans like all sort of discovered this idea at a similar time. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember like Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond talking about it and saying that it was, initially it was not intentional. Like it was just a, a byproduct of the way that they were harvesting crops or not even crops just plants at the time is that familiar yeah so i have four stages of domestication and this kind of gets at that so first can be simply just kind of caring for wild stands of plants or gathering plants and then in the process purposely or accidentally selecting ones that they would like to eat i mean i guess they're always going to be if you're going to eat a plant you're likely to pick the ones that you want to eat so you're sort of selecting maybe unconsciously in a way, right. in that first stage. Yeah. You're not even necessarily growing them. You can just be keeping these plants alive or accidentally planting them, a.k.a. growing out of your feces. <laughs> right. <laughs> probably a common thing that happened early on, probably how humans first learn how to grow plants. Yeah. So, yeah, so then the second stage is, I guess I jumped ahead, the second stage is purposely or accidentally replanting them. And then in the process, you increase the abundance and frequency of the ones that are have desirable traits. Nice. So that's again could be accidental. The third step is the is um, the spread of those plants to new environments and then adapting to new environments. So maybe the next town over, the next village over starts growing them, and then they prefer a different flavor, or it starts growing in different soils or something. So you see the the spreading of varieties. Right. And then the last stage is um, deliberately breeding them for specific qualities for the taste or you know ease of harvesting stuff like that yeah that's cool so there's you get majority of the way there before you even really like are aware or intentionally doing it yeah in many cases they think that's that's what happened yeah so, so that process they think there's about 2500 species of plants that have been domesticated across 160 plant families. So a huge variety of plants have been domesticated to some extent. Very cool. But only about a tenth of those, 250 have been fully domesticated to where they're like, they don't and can't really grow in the wild. Mm -hmm. So the, the full process has only happened in a relatively small number of them. Mm -hmm. I feel like my sense is that plants are better on average at maintaining the ability to reproduce on their own 
when they're domesticated. I don't know if that's just totally a baseless uh, idea. To yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, some of the the traits that get selected for really make them pretty hard to grow in the wild. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, they can grow on their own, but in the wild, once they get fully domesticated, they normally, I don't know, don't tend, to, you don't see like corn plants <laughs> for right. the most part, just like growing out. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, but it's a possibly testable hypothesis. I'll, I don't know how you would test it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Just look around. <laughs> <laughs> right. It feels 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 right. So uh, a lot of the things that uh, people end up selecting for purposely or not uh, is a loss of dormancy. And so lots of plants have the seeds that'll sit in the soil for a really long time. And so selecting against that often happens. And that's one that could definitely happen accidentally. Mm-hmm. And then larger, f- lar- larger fruits, larger seeds, of course non-shattering seeds so in in grains and grasses often in the wild the seeds fall off that's what they need to do to disperse and grow but in many different plants we've selected for ones that don't fall off because then you can gather them up and harvest them okay um shorter life cycle because you you know often want it to grow within a year greater yield and then actually the most common one across uh all the plants is change in chemistry so that could be taste or toxicity um, or pigmentation. Okay. And then uh, more asexual reproduction is another uh, common thing that's been selected for. Yeah. So these these changes ultimately are always genetic changes. I mean, that's the only way, or that's how species change is through altering the genome, and then they express different traits. Mm-hmm. And so all these changes are due to changes in genes mm-hmm. that are then code for the traits that that we want. Right. And so now that we have the tools to study the genome, many studies have identified specific genes um, that have been selected for in the process of domestication. And so there's many, many genes that are involved, um, and they vary widely from species to species. Uh, But in some cases, there have been the same or very similar genes selected in multiple different crops, which is a neat, like very specific example of how we're genetically changing them. So one of those is it's called a waxy gene. The way genes are always given little names just so they can be referred to and fun little fun little nicknames. Yeah, they're normally written in all caps and they're often, you know, they try to give them names that are related to what they think it does. Right. So the the waxy genes, they produce um sticky grains in and that's been the same gene has been selected for in rice, millet, barley, sorghum and amaranth which are some of those aren't even grasses they're totally different families of plants but if you've had like really sticky rice that's a rice variety that has this waxy gene in it oh cool so the same properties were independently domesticated for and also it's literally the same gene that did the did that sort of function exactly yeah yeah it's kind of a cool example where the the cultural preferences of different completely different societies independently found value in the sticky grains. Huh. Everybody wants the sticky rice. They want the sticky rice or sticky amaranth. Yeah. <laughs> and they were used for different things, but yeah, it just seemed like a universally useful thing. And, you know, I mean, amaranth was domesticated in the new world. So like opposite sides of the world in a completely different plant family, these plants all have a shared ancestor- ancestry which means they share some common genes mm-hmm. and those same genes were selected for by different people. So yeah, cool, that's cool. Like repeated genetic modifications. All are, all of us are just one people's man. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so all of the, all of that selection was the way selection and evolution works is from selecting, a, 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 from the standing variation that exists. And that standing variation is created by different mutations. So, just like in the first people that domesticated plants, if you're walking around in the wild, you see, you know, well, these ones have really big fruits and these ones have small fruits. That's the variation that exists. So you pick the big ones. Mm-hmm. So in that way, you're selecting for that variation that exists. Mm-hmm. And then in the process of domestication, new mutations occur. They're always happening. And there's been many studies that show in well, there's a very long term study in corn that showed that new mutations always coming up year after year are contributing to the continued domestication and change in the traits. So ongoing mutation is a big part of it as well. Okay. So there, there's new mutations that immediately become evident that they're desirable. So then like 
the yeah. farmers or whoever are like, oh, sick, this one's like way more tasty. Let's keep using this one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Normally, these are small genes that are making subtle changes, and mm-hmm. uh, it's not it's not like oh, this one has this gene. I'm going to select it. It's like well, that one was just you know a breeder found that that one had a little bit tastier fruit, so then they bred that one in the future. Right. And then that mutation that only showed up once can then spread through the breeding process throughout you know millions of plants. Yeah. The next year. Right. So um, and then new genes can get in the population in the crops and other ways so one way is the domesticated plant or the plant in the process of domestication can cross with the wild plants and so the genes that are still in the wild populations can get crossed back into the domesticated varieties and then those variations can get selected for or make new combinations again Mm, interesting so i wonder if there's situations where like there was some genes in the wild plant that were not quite ready to be able to be useful just because of the wrong combination. But then like yeah. once you've gone a certain distance with the domestication, then you're like, okay, now we're ready for that extra little flare or whatever. Like we, yeah. we can handle it now. Yeah. All the, the genes within a genome interact with each other. So maybe the early part of domestication change maybe made the stem thicker. And so then it could actually hold up this really big fruit, but before it would just fall over. So you can get these new combinations that never existed before all with the same species. And so that's a a way of introducing new genes. And then there's um, another type of crossing where many plants and many animals as well can hybridize where there's different species, you know, normally very closely related species that they can cross a domesticated plant with a close relative. And that can introduce all sorts of new genes as well. And that's a very common approach in crop domestication even still in crop breeding they do that right when there's that crossing of of species or no not species the varieties i guess Mm -hmm. is that like a natural process or is that like i mean are they is that considered genetic modification or like kind of how what is the mechanism of that you know um it's it can be one or the other i mean hybrids happen in the wild all the time But often the crosses that would be done now would be maybe a cross that would never happen in nature, either because they they don't co-occur or maybe like, you know, sometimes they're often like moving the pollen by hand and maybe it would never get in there if we didn't do it. So often it would be something that would never happen in nature. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely a purposeful genetic manipulation because you're moving species or moving genes from one related plant species to another related plant species in a way that may never have happened in the wild. Okay. Yeah. But the actual mechanism of it is still just basic biology, basically. Yeah. Like they're closely related enough that they can interbreed and still be fertile. Right. And that, that happens a lot. So that method you have to stick with things that are closely related enough that they can still cross naturally. Right. Uh, well, <laughs> It's, you know, what, what does naturally mean? It's, it's difficult. They can still, you know, like you said, the normal biology can uh, happen um, once you get those gametes together. Right. And so, um, yeah, th- those hybrids can create all sorts of new genetic variation, which maybe those first crosses are something that's not useful at all, but then they can cross those new hybrids back with the original ones. And then by all sorts of continued crossing you can actually selectively move only a small portion of the genome over or a couple genes over from that new species so Mm. it actually is a way to get only a few genes or a few traits from a wild species into a crop um, while keeping the similar genetic background that was there before yeah very and that's all just through normal breeding you know plant breeding processes yeah so it's like doing genetic modification without having a lab exactly yeah i mean the the move the movement of specific genes from one species to another has been happening accidentally for a very long time and then since there's been focused genetic crop breeding programs in the last hundred years or so that's been a huge focus of crop breeding is bringing in genes from other species right and then some crops are actually the result the crop itself is the result of a hybridization event corn for example there was no there was nothing like corn in the wild it was one plant called Teosinte, which crossed with another plant that I think they're not even sure what it was, and that then resulted in corn, a something that never existed oh, like that at all in wow. the wild. That's crazy. Yeah. I had and no so, idea. Yeah, wheat is that way as well. It's a cross between two things. Strawberries, lettuce, all these are... Cro- the, the, the thing we know and eat 
is only the result of a unique hybridization event. So do you know if those are man-made crossings or are those natural hybridizations or is it just unknown or well some of them they know like strawberries is the strawberries we know as, that we see in the grocery store ha- happened very re- pretty recently mm-hmm. and it was a cross between like two 2001 of, i mean probably like the i don't know when it was like right. the 20s or something like yeah. sometime fr- pretty recently yeah could have been even more recently than that like people were eating strawberries but there were the wild you know i don't know if you've seen wild strawberries they they look similar but they're about an eighth the size of the ones you see in the grocery store. Yeah, totally. So the ones we see now are these like hybrids of two pretty le- there's one I think it's one from Europe and one from America that were crossed and created this it's called polyploid where there's many many duplications of the whole genome in the plant. That mm. happens a lot in plants. Yeah. So the the wild species had basically one copy and then you hybridize them and you get this like eight or 10 copies of the genome and then it results in all sorts of really unusual traits like an insanely massive strawberry and we're like oh that's awesome people will love that and that became the strawberry we know today yeah that's so wild so it's just like a total genetic mutant and we're just like so down with it yeah i mean corn was domesticated so long ago it probably was a natural hybridization event that happened in the wild Mm -hmm. and then whoever found it it was like oh man this is great yeah and started breeding it right yeah, there's lots of wheat was probably similar to that as well. So yeah, you were sort of getting at the language I was hinting at, which is that humans have been genetically modifying plants to serve our purposes for upwards of 12,000 years. Right. Cool. That That's chapter one. Nice. Ready for chapter two? Yeah. <laughs> who was around, Who like what historical characters were around 12,000 years ago? None, maybe? It was probably concurrent with like the development of uh or be pre the development of like written written yeah. word yeah the neo the neolithic is the age that's like the term for it and that is like concurrent with crop growing and writing i believe it was around that time in the middle east where the first writing occurred yeah. so i i can't imagine we know any <laughs> we can't have any records <laughs> of a Right. Uh, an important character before writing happened. Yeah, cool. I, actually, when I was in Toronto, I got I got to see a really cool exhibit. I believe it was Sumerians. I think that's the society. I could have that wrong. But they had they had like a bunch of artifacts that were some of the earliest written things that humans ever wrote. It was really cool. Nice. Uh, and they think it was mostly accounting for like you know I gave you this many cows and you gave me this many bales of wheat and right uh, to keep track of stuff. Sweet. Also, like, I'm just, I see guns, germs, and steel on my bookshelf, so I keep, and also the subject matter, but um, <laughs> oh, yeah. talking about how, like, basically the existence of domestication allowed for societies to exist, or kind of like, not societies, but sort of like urban centers or, you know, high densities of people, which then the high densities of people allowed for specialties, like someone to have a specialty, and and that allowed creation of writing and things like that yeah yeah the the surplus of food that came from agriculture allowed for the development of culture and complex societies yeah said in a much more eloquent way (laughs) (laughs) i read that book recently too nice um and yeah and then you know the thesis of that book is that there's a lot of chance events that of why some societies end up having agriculture or not that had mostly to do with what plants were available in the climate, things like that. Right. And kind of like what you were saying about how certain crops are able to easily move in certain directions based on like similar habitats and climate and stuff. And like the, yeah. the latitude was like way harder of a jump to make than the longitude. Yeah. So when wheat was domesticated in the Middle East, it pretty quickly moved all across Eurasia, basically. Sweet. So as all those crops moved around and became more common, um, pest became a bigger and bigger problem. There's many pests of crop plants, but many will, will kind of focus on um, insect pests. Cool. And so all wild plants have insects that fed on them. That you know, there's there's no wild plant in the world that doesn't have some bugs that eat it. Mm-hmm. So all of these crops that we domesticated already had stuff that ate them. So once we started growing them, there was bugs around that were going to keep eating them. So those were the first pests. They're just, well, I evolved to eat wheat and I'm going to keep eating it. And now there's a bunch of it. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm doing great. Right. And so even today, 
with all of the methods we have to try to prevent pests, all the various pests reduce crop yield by about 30%. Wow. And so that's about 10% by herbivores, mostly insects, 10% by pathogens, and 10% by weeds. All of those together still do a lot to limit the amount of food we can produce. Right. Interesting. And without all the various methods we use to prevent those pests, they think it would estimate it would be more like 65% loss of the food we try to grow. Wow. We would struggle to feed ourselves if we weren't um, trying to keep down the pests. Yeah, totally. Just like the majority of the crops are, are lost. Globally, humans spend about $56 billion a year on pesticides. Hmm. And that's about 6 billion pounds spread on, on the earth every year. <laughs> Wonderful. As we learned from the bald eagle episode last week, there's all sorts of unintended and potentially horrific consequences of all those pesticides. But right. also, without them, more than half of our food would be gone. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, double-edged sword. Totally, yeah. In the U.S., it's about $9 billion, and most of that is in agriculture. And actually, the, the largest amount of pesticides are herbicides, but insecticides are about $2 billion a year spent um, on insecticides. What an economy. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Bezos has got to get in on that. Right. The numbers for how the, the dollar amount of pesticides that are sold just to the public is pretty wild. So it's almost a third of the money spent on pesticides are just by people, not in agriculture. Oh, that's surprising. Yeah. I mean... It's it's only about 6% of the total poundage, but it's a third of the cost. I assume when you're buying in bulk for agriculture, it's cheaper. Right, right. There's a lot of the money spent on on insecticides is people's home use and, you know, golf courses and other sort of home and garden uses. Yeah. I wonder if people are just particularly bad at growing gardens in an efficient way and they're just like dumping pesticides on them because they're like, ah, these bugs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In general, like the, the, the volume per area used in home gardens if people are using it is way higher than in agriculture normally because people don't know what they're doing they're yeah i'll like, spray it all over the place and <laughs> right. like you just used as much as you'd use for a whole acre of corn or whatever right and then your backyard organic strawberries are just like balls of poison <laughs> <laughs> right so there's a few reasons why crops get so much trouble from pests the sort of the initial reason is what i said before like well there were started from wild plants they're just pests that already ate them mm -hmm. and so the first thing that i thought of was that well we're growing these crops in really giant abundances often with limited genetic variation and so i would assume that having a landscape covered in them mm -hmm. would like grow lots of pests mm -hmm. and that might be true but the research i found trying to answer that question kind of suggests it wasn't so oh. You know, there, there's studies that were able to look at a bunch of crops that varied in how much of the landscape was natural mm -hmm. versus how much of the landscape was the crop. And there wasn't really a big effect on pests. There was a big effect on the predators that feed on pests, so like wasp and things, uh, but not on the pests themselves. So I don't know, may maybe the research isn't able to address that, or maybe that's just not an important component. Did, did you find things that looked at genetic variation within like let's say you have a plot of land that's for, made for crops like genetic variation within that strictly looking at that variable or was it more like here's like one that has 12 species here's one that has one species uh well this was looking at like landscape variation so yeah. like is the surrounding several miles all also cropland or is it have like natural land okay i see yeah so it's like landscape diversity. Right. Um, the, I know there are studies looking at genetic diversity. I don't think at really large scales, but some plots show some effects. But the effects of genetic diversity are complicated, mm -hmm. to say the least. Right. So it's not necessarily the case that it just like reduces pest pressure. Yeah. It might. But I didn't see any study addressing that question specifically. Okay. Um, one reason why pests are a problem on crops is that the process of domestication has made crops more susceptible to pests. And this has been something that people have sort of thought might be true for a long time, but a huge meta-analysis found that um, in general, if you compare a crop to its wild ancestor, the crop is gets eaten way more. It's just more tasty to a bug. Right. We still don't really fully know why this is the case, but one possibility is you know, we selected for plants that grow faster and are more nutritious, that just makes them tastier and easier to eat totally. to the bugs as well. Right. 
also another guess from me is um, that <laughs> if you're domesticating plants to you know out of the wild to be grown for consumption by humans or whatever uh, animals or humans then you might also be domesticating out some of the defensive mechanisms that they might have had in the wild. Yes, that that is definitely the the leading hypothesis that most people thought would be true. This this study actually looked at the chemistry and they well, they can't answer that question exactly, but they found that the changes in chemistry weren't as clear as we thought they might be. And part of the reason for that is like there's also um, breeding to like bring back in defensive chemicals as well. Ah. So it's maybe more selective. So we're, we're breeding out some compounds, but breeding back in others because breeding to, um, help crop resistance to pesticides is a main focus of breeding in the last century. Okay. Well. So, totally. That makes sense. Well, I'm glad I didn't do my PhD on that. <laughs> yeah. Skipped that one. And then the last one is that the agricultural practices can make crops easier to exploit. Um, so this is kind of similar to the first one, but they're all grown together in one place with low variation. And then that can also mean that the pests can evolve to adapt to those crops. And so the first thing I said about like the landscape is more about the ecology. Like, are there abundances more? And it seems like maybe not, but we definitely know that growing all crops together in a uniform way has led to the evolution of pests that are more effective at exploiting our crops okay right so that's more the evolutionary angle from it yeah maybe that was more kind of what i was trying to get at with like the the genetic variation like if you have one thing that's like you know an infinite amount of this one thing that's exactly the same then suddenly you have a pest that like if it specializes if it can specialize in that then it can just do great everywhere yeah Exactly. Yeah. So they can adapt to that one thing. And then of course that process of adaptation increases their growth rate and then that changes their abundance and affects their ecology. It's all inter inter tied Mm -hmm. in that way. But there's been some amazing examples of adaptation to crops. So one of them is um, this um, weed that grows in rice fields. And so for centuries, uh, people have been weeding rice fields and going through the, the flooded uh, patties of rice and pulling out plants they didn't want. And there's this plant called uh, barnyard grass that has evolved to look almost exactly like a rice seedling. Oh, wild. And so it's really hard to, we- you know, once they get larger, they can often see them. But as a seedling, it's almost impossible to weed them out now. So it's a it's a mimicry of a plant to ad- adapt to the specific environment that humans have created. So cool. Very clever. And then kind so of a, a more, yeah, it's, I mean, evolution's, evolution results in clever outcomes. Right. And there's a, a type of fly called the, oh man, how do I say this? Hessian, H-E-S-S-I-A-N. I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Um, it's a fly that attacks wheat. And so there's been a so much breeding in wheat to try to uh, make it resistant to these flies. And every time they introduce a new variety, pretty quickly, they, the flies evolve to overcome it. So there's like <laughs> repeated again and again and again, these flies that evolve to overcome the new varieties we put out. Yeah. And after a while, they're like, why are we wasting our time with this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, so that's, that's the setup of crop domestication and pests. So let's take a little break and okay. we'll come back to talk about BT. All right. Welcome back. We had a little break and uh, we realized that uh, this topic is way too long for one episode. So we we're going to keep this first episode, these first two acts, um, and then leave the next two for uh, the next episode. But so, yeah, so up till now, we've covered crop domestication. And for me, I think as I've learned about this over the years and over the last week, really kind of bringing home that we humans have been manipulating plants for so long and how much of that has been genes sort of flying all over the place. So Hamilton, I was curious if sort of putting in that context of manipulating plants for so long has made you, if you were to go into the produce section and see a strawberry or banana 
or lettuce or do you look at those in a different way now or any different views of the world from that context? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely makes you kind of reconsider what you're looking at when you look at any kind of produce or crop, you know, wheat or something that comes from a crop, like a domesticated crop, you know, from, you know, one perspective of like, this is a, you know, like is a raw ingredient. It's just like comes from the earth, super natural and pure and stuff. And then <laughs> yeah. on the other hand, you're like, this is like a total genetic monster, you know, like this is, you know, it's, it's basically like the, the mutated beast and growing in someone's basement or whatever, like that's the result of, of thousands of years of, um, genetic manipulation basically. So it definitely puts a, a different kind of perspective on it when you think about it that way. I think it highlights how meaningless the term natural is sometimes. Totally. <laughs> it's like, well, it's alive and <laughs> it evolved to get here, but it would have never existed if we hadn't spent 10,000 years shaping it to our needs. Totally. It kind of reminds me of like, I don't know how much of truth there is to this, but I think I heard that like with advertising, there's certain keywords that you are, you know, allowed or not allowed to use on packaging, you know, like organic or Gene mm. you know genetically modified whatever things like that there's like rules about them but for the word natural i think there's just no holds barred like you can just use natural for literally anything and it, and it doesn't matter because it's basically meaningless that sounds right i mean I, I wouldn't be surprised i know organic in the u.s has a very specific meaning it's something you have to you know be certified for right H how well all those rules are followed and stuff is sort of a whole different topic and actually maybe doing an episode on organic agriculture because i feel like that's another topic that is not what a lot of people think it means right <laughs> as well so yeah totally um and you know that's an, an another way of you know i think organic you think of you know maybe people think of a beautiful little garden and you know most organic farms are giant industrial farms that they spray pesticides and stuff and right you know it's you know it is it more natural i don't know it's it i i think it's a there's a lot of good things to it but i don't think it's what most people think it is totally i remember one time you kind of giving me a little <laughs> of, of like i'm like oh well you know they they don't have this style of carrots and organic or whatever and you're like man what even is organic <laughs> man <laughs> and i'm like oh i don't know i thought it was like good but maybe it's nothing yeah, I think yeah, I think the main thing was I actually remember that because um, I think you were saying, well, we I don't feel like I need to to wash it because you know they don't use pesticides or I don't have to worry about pesticides and it's like, well, they they use plenty of pesticides in organic agriculture as well, so the the potential risk of you know pesticide residue may not be that different, right? So yeah, and then thinking about pesticides, of course, they only exist to pests and so the long history of various pests feeding on crops is you know part of the the biggest reason why they continue to be such a problem is they're constantly evolving like mm -hmm. we're changing these plants all the time and the the pests are just evolving to keep up with it and there's a sort of a metaphor in evolutionary biology that's used a lot which is the red queen which is from alice in wonderland oh uh, yeah where I think it's the Red Queen always has to keep running to stay in the same place. Huh, nice. And so the idea of the Red Queen in evolutionary biology is that when you have an antagonist of some sort, you know, a, a parasite or a predator, like as you evolve, they evolve with you. So you're always evolving, but you're still staying essentially in the same place. Like say they eat 20% of your leaves you could evolve all sorts of new chemistry to keep them from eating you, but they're likely to still eat 20% of your leaves. <laughs> right. And that's what happens in nature. And we're, you know, of course we're seeing that that's exactly what happens in agriculture as well, because it's still, you know, it's still biology. It's still nature. Things are still evolving. So when we're thinking of how to deal with all this stuff, we have to keep evolution in mind and we're, we're the red queen always running. So we have to come up with new, ideas and techniques to try to get ahead right also isn't everything involved also the red queen say that again isn't like aren't all the players the red queen like oh the, yeah the, right the parasites and the yeah there's probably some way you could 
incorporate the mirror metaphor from the story as well. <laughs> Maybe throw a Cheshire cat in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I knew uh, more about the story, I could probably try to elaborate. I, I have dibs on Mad Hatter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know. Uh, really, really looking forward to being a character that has a mercury poisoning. <laughs> Is that what was going on there? Yeah, that's like the idea of a Mad Hatter is that there's someone that works with hats and they clean hats. And one of the mechanisms, like a way of cleaning a, a, I forget if it was a felt hat or a leather hat, is like they'd use mercury to get the dirt out of it. And then they oh, just God. go crazy for mercury poisoning. So they're yeah. Mad Hatters. Damn. They're like, <laughs> these hats are so clean. <laughs> they're like, okay, man, like, can I, can I just pay you and leave now? <laughs> Given that 10,000 years of development of agricultural technology, you know, we haven't bested nature really at all. So there's constant efforts and attempts to come up with new ideas and technologies. And that's really where genetic modification comes in. It's These are extensions of what humans have been doing for a very long time. We're selecting for exactly what we want. We're moving genes around. But genetic modification is a more focused, specialized way of basically trying to get ahead in the evolutionary arms race. Totally. And if you kind of put like yourself into the context of, of the timeline, I don't know what it would be the eighties or something like when mm -hmm. you're trying to grow crops, you're trying to feed people, you're trying to reduce the amount that's destroyed. Um, and that's eaten and you're like, okay, we have, we're dumping these pesticides, all the bald eagles are dying, you know, uh, you know, yeah. what, like, what is like, what do we do? Like, what's the next step to kind of grow crops successfully in, in the least sort of destructive way to the, to the rest of the environment? Yeah. So that whole progression of, you know, let's, let's really mechanize agriculture. Let's focus on adding fertilizer and pesticides and growing it at a large scale. That is all a product of the green revolution, which was, you know, from like the forties to the sixties. And that was a massive explosion of technology that basically lots of people thought the earth was heading towards mass famine and not being able to support the amount of people that were on it. Mm -hmm. And the green revolution came with all these new agricultural technologies and we're all still here. Mm -hmm. Maybe partly in response to like dust bowl depression kind of situations where they were like just really blowing it on a large scale and like a lot of people were dying yeah. of starvation because of it. Yeah, exactly. So we knew something had to happen and um, it's a bit of a long story of all the green revolution, so we can't get into that. But it, it, it led to the type of agriculture that's dominant today that's very focused on ge genetic monocultures, um, intense crop breeding and irrigation and fertilizer and pesticide use. And it worked really well for a while, but of course all of that biology caught up with it. And so we're having depletion of the soils and we're having all the side effects of all those pesticides. And then of course the evolution of pesticide resistance. And so all of those, that was the great technology. That was the big jump in the arms race for a while. Mm -hmm. And now we're kind of, yeah, the eighties come and we're like, all right, we got to take some of this new biochemistry and biotechnology and you know try to apply that to this global problem totally did by any chance bernie sanders start the green revolution <laughs> <laughs> we need a green revolution <laughs> it's a bit bore before his time but... <laughs> like four years before his time <laughs> sorry probably go on. yeah probably not that far <laughs> i mean it's relatively you know it's not that long ago that the green revolution was borlaug is the dude okay he was um a guy went down to Mexico and basically revolutionized this new way of crop breeding to create these super varieties that had really high yield. Nice. It's yeah, it's kind of wild how recent some of that stuff is. And he's, you know, he, I think he won a Nobel peace prize or definitely, or a, um, Nobel corn prize, some sort of Nobel <laughs> prize, because, you know, I mean, he's thought that some of his advancements may have saved more lives than any other person ever. Right. Good work, Borlaug. In many ways, it kind of, in terms of us reaching carrying capacity of humans on Earth, it kind of kicked the can down the road because all of those advancements were sort of short term because mm -hmm. they were really high resource. They take a ton of fossil fuels, you know, lots of things that can't really be kept up right. necessarily in the long term. And they have their own side effects. Yeah, right. 
that I think many of them weren't really sort of realized initially. Bad work, Borlaug. <laughs> kind of, a, yeah, kind of a controversial character in, in hindsight. But it's like we didn't really have any other options and, you know, got to work with, just like evolution, you got to work with what you're given and do the best you can. Yeah. So I think that can, uh, you know, nicely set us up for next week when we really dive into the genetically modified plants and what are BT crops and all of that. Cool. So I guess we can uh, pretty much wrap it up for today. Nice. Thanks for uh, learning about crop domestication uh, with me. Thanks for presenting to us all, Nash. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know you're sincere, but I think so, so, somehow. It, I it I have not paid for my acting classes. I haven't received my free <laughs> acting classes since I relocated to LA yet. I think right. I need to like go f- find the sign up sheet somewhere in downtown. Yeah, I- I'm sure there's public programs to try to make everyone an actor. Down there. Right. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll pick this up next week and uh, see you next time. All right. Peace. Mm-hmm.